like Dave said, we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. I'll read the passage in its entirety, I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Starting in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May Christ and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes th though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to meet together as a body, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, I pray that it falls on fertile soil. Lord, I pray that I would hide behind the cross and that you would be glorified and honored. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt out of place? Like you have noticeably been different than those around you? Well, I have found myself in this situation multiple times. Before I had finally watched the show, The Office, I find myself in groups of people where someone would make a joke relating to the office and I would be the only one not laughing. This happened on numerous occasions and I seemed to be the only one not to understand the references that were being made. I'm also a Clemson fan. Now this is a common thing here in the South. However, I married my beautiful bride who happened to be a part of a family of full of South Carolina fans. Needless to say, it took me a while to get uh, on their good side. In both these examples, I was singled out as someone who did not fit the characteristics of those around me. This is how we should be as followers of Christ. We should be a people that are noticeably different than the world around us. And this is what Peter is reminding these believers in this text. We should live our lives in a manner that testifies to our inheritance that lies ahead of us. Peter is writing to these Gentiles facing persecution from the Roman Empire. Nero, the emperor of Rome at this time, had a lust to build and expand, and he burned down the city of Rome to do so, so that he could build from scratch. The Romans being devastated as they had lost their temples and household idols, in a surge to redirect their anger, Nero chose the Christians as a scapegoat. Soon after, the Christians were being persecuted all across the entire Roman Empire. And that's where we pick up here 
Peter is writing to encourage these believers to live victoriously in the midst of hostility, hostility and suffering. Verses 1 and 2 is a brief greeting. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Here we see that Peter establishes himself as the author of the letter. He was personally called and commissioned by Christ and ministered with him after his resurrection. He was an eyewitness to many of the sufferings of Christ, making him fitting to encourage these believers in their sufferings. Peter refers to these believers as elect exiles, which means called out ones in Greek. This is a beautiful label referring to an eternal city, residents of an eternal city, and foreigners, strangers in a land not their own. This has similarities to God's people of Israel in the Old Testament. Peter is writing to these churches in these cities, which are lo located in modern-day Turkey. In verse 2, we see that Peter is writing this according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Foreknowledge means that God planned beforehand, meaning that God pre-thought, predetermined, or predestined each Christian to salvation. We, the elect exiles, are saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has set us apart from sin and unbelief unto faith and righteousness. True salvation produces obedience to Jesus Christ and his word. The sprinkling with, uh, with his blood is a reference to Exodus 24, 4 through 8, where Moses sprinkles sacrificial blood on the people of Israel as a sign and symbol of stealing of their faith their promise to obey God's word. Our first point tonight will be found in verses 3 through 5, and it's our great inheritance. Verse 3 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. His mercy is where all our hope begins. We are in desperate need of his mercy, and his mercy is the only reason reason we have salvation. As Keith made the point this past Sunday, we all deserve wrath, but God is merciful to his people. It is important to notice as well that the New Testament authors, the amount of times that they reference Christ post the cross, they never go too many verses without referencing back to him. This should be the same for our minds and in our mouths in our daily lives. We should never get tired of reminding ourselves and those around us of his mercy that we have received through Jesus Christ. He continues, as he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How can one be born again? Well, through the resurrection of Christ. You cannot luck, work, or hope your way into this inheritance. It is through Christ alone. The resurrection is what secures our status as born again, and we have a second resurrection to look forward to. Since we are born again into a living hope, our life now has direction, meaning, and purpose. Let's run a race focused on Christ in our ultimate heavenly home. Remember, we are exiles in this world. What are we born again into? Well, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter is urging these persecuted Christians to look past their troubles and trials and to their internal inheritance in heaven. How often do you think about heaven? Do you long for it? 
Let us be a people that constantly long for the day we will be in the presence of our Savior. Verse 5 reads, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our salvation and our inheritance cannot be taken away. We are being guarded by God himself. We cannot be written out of God's will. Beloved, we shall live freely now that we have an inheritance waiting for us that is unmatched. Our second point tonight is suffering well as a follower of Christ. This can be found in verses 6 through 9. Six, verse 6 reads, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. We can rejoice, for we have the promise of heaven and what is to come. However, it is probable that our lives will be filled with struggles and trials. There is comfort in this uncomforting promise of suffering. And it is that Christ, our Savior, went through pain, struggles, temptations, sufferings, and trials. The one that we devote our lives to went through the same struggles we go through. Look to Christ as our ultimate example. Christ went through sufferings, temptations, and trials while he was on this earth and was submissive to the Father's will. But verse 6 is a bummer about verse 7. Verse 7 is here to tell us the purpose of our suffering. Verse 7 reads, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there are a couple of passages that um, support Peter's argument here in verse 7. James 1, 3 through 4. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We go through sufferings so that our faith will be tested and found to be strong and legitimate. Struggles and trials tell us where we really are with God. They provide an opportunity to be refined and sanctified. They also remind us of God's sovereignty, as there is always a reason to rejoice. Do you ever look back at the path that God has brought you on? You see how he has molded you into the person he has desired for you to be? But at the time, you did not understand the purpose and the situations that you went through. Let us be in awe of the sovereignty and the goodness of our God. Verse 8 reads, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Many of these believers would not have been able to see Christ face to face. We likewise do not have the opportunity to see Christ face to face. However, our faith does not change. We actively see the working of Christ in our daily lives and within our hearts. This provides an emphasis on the necessity of the church to live out the Christian life so that others may see. Christ is not walking on the earth physically in the flesh today. Therefore, we as the church need to be the hands and feet of Christ for the sake of others. Verse 9 is not to say that if we have enough faith or grind enough struggles that we can reach salvation. Here is saying that true believers 
will reach the outcome of their faith, which is eternal salvation of our souls. One of the best ways we can endure suffering and trials is to remind ourselves of the future inheritance in our future home. One day, all of this will be irrelevant, and we will be wholly consumed and satisfied in heaven. Our last and final point, the gospel is worth sharing. And this will be found in verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. The Old Testament prophets did not know exactly when Christ would come. However, they did know that he would suffer and be glorified. Isaiah, in particular, would have been thrilled to hear that Christ was telling about actually came and was incarnated. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 reads, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peter continues in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that they have not been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. The Old Testament prophets, like Isaiah, were serving us in their prophecies and predictions. We get to enjoy being on this side of the cross, not wondering when and where the Messiah was coming, but we know, in fact, that he did come. This is good news that we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and that we put our faith in him and repent of our sins we have, a, we have an internal inheritance waiting for us. This truth should be shared. For Romans 10, 14 through 15 reads, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Will we be the ones who get to share this good news to others? The gospel that preaches a salvation that angels long to look for? For Luke fifteen seven says that heaven and angels rejoice when one is saved. To conclude, I have three practical takeaways from this passage. The first Cherish your salvation. It is precious. Angels long. Thank God for your salvation every day. It cannot be taken or, stri taken or stripped from you. The second, God's intended plan for you is to suffer. Know that God is not unjust or cruel just because bad things happen to you. He has a purpose for your trials and it is used to glorify him. Third and finally, Believe well through your trials. Trials are put in place to demonstrate your faith and refine you. Trials and come in all shapes and sizes. Fall back on your faith in Christ, no matter what the circumstance is. Pray with me. Father, you are merciful. Lord, let us be a people that we would have faith during trials. Lord, that we would believe that you can come overcome all. 
Lord, we have an inheritance waiting for us. Let that be our focus, though we might have trials and sufferings in this temporary home, Lord. Let us focus on our permanent home with you, Father. I pray all this in Christ's name.